Hello fellow quarantiners. Uh, this is um, a home lecture for Norse mythology. Uh, what you see in front of you is again my slides from fall semester 2019 at the amazing Front Range Community College in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, so this image, this is Yagdrasil, uh, and I should say right off the bat, I speak English. I do not speak Old Norse. Uh, there is a video recommendation for those that are really interested in language. Language is super fascinating. Um, I'm not a master of all of them. I am a master of the humanities. Um, I am a mythologist, a medievalist, and a European historian. So I have some cred, but no, I cannot speak the language. So I may uh, butcher some of these words, but guess what? We're just going to push forward because the alternative is to do nothing, and that's not what I'm about. So, again, this image is a drawing that I found online, a free GIF. Uh, you can go to Google and in the search engine type free image, and pretty much any image that you'd like to see, you'll, you'll get some type of response. Um, so, this is Yagdrasil, this is the world tree, and I'd just like you to take maybe a minute and look at this and ask yourself, what do I see, what do I wonder? All right, moving on. You can jot your thoughts down if you'd like to. This is a uh, an exercise that I would do at the beginning of class. It's called memory recall. Uh, I'd ask my scholars, what do you remember from the last time we met? What, what stuck out in your memory? So the reason that I do this is because I read James Lang's Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning. So this is a little neuro study for you. Uh, and his quote, let's just read it together, every time we extract a piece of information or an experience from our memory, we are strengthening, strengthening neural pathways that lead from our long-term memory into our working memory, where we can use our memories to think and take actions. So what does that mean? That means that our brains, uh, they're definitely organs, but like a muscle, we can flex our memory skills by thinking back and recall something that we learned previously. So if you still have your pen out, make a little note. What do you remember from the first lecture that I posted? Does anything stand out in your mind? Uh, the more you do this with anything at all, not just online lecture, but in real life, uh, the more you think about what you did before, the stronger your memory becomes. So this is just an image of uh, what I would ask them. What do you remember from the previous class? They would turn those in, and it just gave me an idea of what stood out in my lecture. Um, the difficult part was usually people had different answers. People remember different things, but that's all right. I just want you to think. I, I wanted my scholars to think, and I want you all to think. Critical thought is an amazing tool. Um, so after they would write then my recap would show up and I would tell them what we did. We, we had our introductions, we played telephone or rumor, and we <clears throat> checked out some of the theoretical approaches for, or methods of studying mythology. We also defined what is myth. Um, and I do want to note, I had to tell all them, so I'll tell you too, um, a word on laughter. So I'm victim of nervous laughter. There are times that I laugh, and it's not that I think something is funny. A lot of times it's just that there's nothing left to do. Uh, for those that did uh, the reading at the beginning of the Prose Edda from Snorri Sturluson, uh, can you tell me who's in this image? There's three individuals standing here, and then there's one very important uh, deity over here. So this, this is uh, Ymir. He is what these three gods, Odin uh, and his two brothers, repurposed. He, they took Ymir and took him apart and turned him into the earth. So uh, the favorite part of Ymir for me was his brains. They turned that into the clouds. So it makes me think of how many times people have heard, uh, your head's in the clouds. So maybe that came from Norse mythology. So a little bit about the text I recommended everyone to take a look at. 
The Younger Edda, or The Prose Edda, by Snorri Sturluson. It was written in 12th to 13th century. Uh, for the textbook reading, my scholars would have uh, confronted the legend of King Gelfi, or Ganglier. Um, and the next slide, it, it talks about this. But some of the things to keep in mind, what societal factors are at play, what could be the author's motivation, and what gains and losses resulted for the culture? Those are three good questions to always have in your mind whenever you're reading literature. So I'm going to give you a, a little summary here of what uh, King Gelfi was up to. And I'll just read it, read it aloud. Uh, Sterlison's prose Edda includes stories about the old gods, related through a conversation between King Gelfi, who transforms himself into Ganglier, and the three high ones, who are actually Odin. This story was recorded in medieval world, but the oral tradition has roots in antiquity. Gilfi, a Christian king, seeks out pagan authorities for old Norse methods of religion. Entering into competition, they decide whoever can answer all the questions is the wisest, and therefore they'll use the preferred system. Gilfi, disguised as Ganglier, continues posing questions for the three high ones who continue answering with stories. So every time the king has a question, uh, the three high ones, who are actually Odin, um, Odin often comes in three forms, as, and three is a very symbolic number for mythology. Three represents uh, the beginning, the middle, the end, uh, birth, present, death. Um, can anybody else think of anything that is super important that comes in threes? I, I could spend a whole lecture just talking about the number three, but make your brain think about some answers. And of course, post in the comments if you feel the need. Uh, so my scholar challenge, I like to, to make them do things in class because I didn't want to just be up there doing all the talking. I wanted them to converse with me. So I would ask them for this uh, thought experiment if they could do some active reading for me. Someone would read this aloud and then uh, we would, we would uh, answer the questions. So... Uh, I'll give you a moment to, to skim over this while I read it. This is, this is the end of the prose edda, so spoiler alert. After all of this has happened, after uh, Galfi and the three wise ones um, stopped answering questions, I'll, I'll just have to tell you what happened here in the story. Galfi, the king, the, the Christian king, he's asked his last question and the aces have not, or the three high ones have not answered. And he turns around, and suddenly he's no longer in a hall. There are no three high ones with him. He's by himself, and he's in a field. So which side won the competition? It's a great question because you can argue it from both sides. You can totally say that the Christian uh, king and Christianity won because the three high ones were no longer there. However, in the afterward, we learn a little bit from the aces. So this is after the challenge, after Gelfi no longer sees the three high ones anymore. So uh, Sterlison tells us, the aces now sat down to talk and held their counsel and remembered all the tales that were told to Gelfi. So insert here, uh, the aces are the old gods. They're, the aces are the Aesir. Um, they gave the very same names that had been named before to the men and places that were there. This they did for the reason that, when a long time has elapsed, men should not doubt that those aces of whom these tales were now told, and those to whom the same names were given, were all identical. There is one who is called Thor, and he is Asa Thor, the old. He is Oku Thor and to him are ascribed the great deeds done by Hector in Troy. But men think that the Turks have told of Ulysses, and have called him Loke, for, those, for the Turks were his greatest enemies. So anybody that likes uh, history, or Brad Pitt, may recognize uh, a few names. Hector, Ulysses, Ulysses is also um, Odysseus, it's the same, same person. Um, so who was Hector and where did he show up? What does Troy mean to you? 
So what the what the um, aces are doing here is is connecting uh, an event, the the Battle of Troy. Um, they're they're saying that that is history. So the ancients believed that that Troy was a, a real battle. They didn't understand it as myth. They thought that it really happened. So uh, Sturluson is connecting Norse mythology with Greek Greek uh, history or or legend. Um, so it's a pretty clever clever maneuver on the author's part. All right, I want to share with you one of my absolute favorite uh, Norse linguist. His name is Dr. Jackson Crawford. He currently is a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, there's a video and I'm going to include a link um, underneath this lecture slide so you can check out Dr. Crawford's work. Everything he does is fantastic. Uh, the video that I'm going to be identifying though, he introduces you to some of the gods, tells you who they are, what they can do, and uh, he notes that we could understand the Norse gods more as personality over function. So a lot of times the, the gods are representation of something that, that we don't fully understand. Um, in class, we would assign personality to the deity. So uh, Thor is a great example. Thor, I attach with rage. Um, anytime that, that you're just seized by uncontrollable rage and you don't know what to do with it. I, I would call that you're having a Thor moment. Uh, another another one that's fairly um, obvious, Freja. Uh, Freja is the goddess of love and beauty. So what emotion could Freja possibly represent? Uh, I'll leave that open. You can fill in that blank yourself. Uh, Dr. Crawford also talks about poetry and and what type of purpose poetry had. Um, saying things in in a poetic form helps things remain intact. Uh, a good contemporary example would be uh, it might be hard for us to remember a story but if we can remember a song and we can sing it then uh, we usually get the words pretty much perfect. So the cadence and the iambic pentameter help us as humans to remember uh, larger works. Also, a uh, purpose of poetry is that it lists it lists different names, and this works as evidence for heritage. Uh, can anybody think of a ancient text or a medieval text where names are listed over and over and over again in a huge litany? Uh, I'm sure you can. Um, also, repetition was understood as a feat. So maybe in contemporary world we kind of we brag about uh, mm, I don't know what type of car we have If we have a really expensive fancy car then then that tells people that, that we're proud of ourselves and we have ex achieved things in life for antiquity and medieval world uh, being able to repeat something was a feat it was something you could brag about I know it's hard for us to understand but for them they really uh, felt that they were of a higher intellect if they could repeat everything that was just said to them. So that shows up a good bit in uh, ancient literature if you're if you're ever reading. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is a fantastic example, example of that. There's lots of repetition. Alright, uh, here's a, a closer look at the Nine Worlds. Um, so this is one of Odin's abilities. Maybe you've heard of Odin before. He's the All-Father, Old, old One-Eye. Um, Mr. Wednesday. Wednesday itself is is uh, originally called Woden's Day. Uh, that's where we got the name of the week from Odin. Um, so Odin is able to travel <clears throat> throughout these nine worlds. He's got some some pretty swanky abilities. Uh, but the nine worlds themselves grow from Yggdrasil or the world tree. So Yggdrasil was that first image I asked you if you noticed anything about. So these are the worlds. Uh, Asgard is where the, the gods live. Helheim is where Hel lives. So Hel is both a person and a place. Um, she's Loki's daughter. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, here's another image of Yagdrasil. This one's slightly different than the one at the beginning, but it explains the, the worlds a little bit more. So Elfheim is the realm of the elves. Um, over here is Raging Fire. So this would be light and dark. Do, do we notice some uh, opposites maybe? Here's Vanaheim. This is the realm of the veneer. The veneer of the fertility goddesses and gods. Uh, Frey and Freja, the twins, children of Njord. Uh, that's where they're from. So there's here's more of uh, Nefelheim is the land of ice and ice and mist. Notice that it is opposing Musselheim, the raging fire. Um, and here's where the Jotunheim, this is where the, the realm of the frost giants, so that's where Loki is originally from. However, he lives in Asgard uh, up here with the other gods, uh, with the Asas or the Aesir. Um, and the reason for that is a hostage situation. What they did was exchange members of the family uh, so that, pretty much so that they knew that that their people would not be hurt because they had somebody from from another family. And Dr. Crawford asked that we uh, that we acknowledge that the giants aren't necessarily a different species from the Aesir. Uh, just for us to think of them more like families, that they're different families that don't always get along. So here is an image of the map. Uh, in class, I would have all of these labels whited out so that my scholars could fill in uh, in their own hand and write down where the realms are and what they what they meant. So there's studies that show just the act of writing something yourself helps you to remember it. <clears throat> so you may want to try this at home. You can draw your own Yagdrasil tree and then uh, just simply write the write the names of the realm in here. So this is where we would talk about the Icelandic elves. So maybe uh, we're in we're in West Virginia here, so there may be some fairy lore that you all know. So a good bit of us have Celtic roots. So the elves are somewhat comparable with the fairies. Um, modern Icelanders respect the elves. They fully believe that they are real. Um, you can check out this post that I found online. It, it talks about the elves uh, and helps explain it a little bit. So the elves, I would associate them with members of the fae uh, or fairy. Uh, some people may call them kobolds, trolls, or ogres, but the elves are slightly different. Um, I have a, another lecture that if we make it that far for week 13 or 14, I talk about the fae. Um, but this is pretty interesting. This is an elf house. It's a it's a natural elf rock. Um, do you notice anything about it? Ah, there's a face. Uh, humans are genetically disposed to look for faces and things. Uh, it's a very very old genetic code that we have. Um, we're looking for faces and things because we want to determine if what we see is, is a predator or not. Um, but above the the elf rock are some elf houses. So here's a man's legs to show you just for size. Uh, but people prepare these little houses and they put them out there uh, so that the elves have a place to live. But elves typically prefer natural structures. So there is a uh, rather interesting story about Iceland. Uh, the Icelanders wanted to install a highway. Um, they tried it a few different times. This elf rock was in the way, so they, they moved it. Every time they moved the elf rock, bad things started happening to the construction workers. The construction equipment was failing. They, they couldn't progress. Um, they tried it in the 70s, they tried it again in the 90s, and then recently in the, the 2000s. Um, and every time bad things happened, so they put that rock back there. Um, they ended up deciding that the elves wanted their rock left alone, so their highway isn't exactly how they planned. It has to go around the rock to preserve that housing for the elves. So I think I talked about Crash Course in my, my first lecture. 
Um, there's one for Norse mythology, and it and a link will be included in the comments. If you want to, you can check it out. Um, one thing I want to touch on, the word deity. So deity means god or goddess, or, or typically an, an immortal being. But uh, whenever you hear the word deity, know that I'm talking about a god or a goddess. Um, for Crash Course, the uh, the narrator, he he uses Thoth a great bit, which makes sense because Thoth is the Egyptian god of wisdom and writing. So that's why he appears often. All right, after you watch the video, if you could, leave some comments that answer these questions. Um, are there any themes that you notice in Norse mythology? Does the concept of Norse deity as personality make them easier to understand? Uh, and the word personification, just in case you don't know what it means, it's a human device of giving non-human objects or entities human traits. We like to do that. Uh, we like to try to make things human. But I would say that, that things or other animals, objects, and such, they're probably pretty happy being who they are. They don't necessarily want to be human. Um, but it's completely natural for us to try to do this. Uh, if you want to know more about Sturluson, the author, I highly recommend downloading the primary text from Gutenberg. Uh, it's a free ebook available to everyone. So the next few slides uh, I'm going to go through. You can hopefully copy and paste so that you can revisit them later. Um, what I'd like you to do is read the brief excerpt and then answer the questions that follow. Uh, if anybody knows how to attach PDFs in Facebook, I would love to know because um, it's much easier to just be able to download this reading yourself. Um, but again, you can definitely check out uh, Sterlison's link uh, for, the, for a free copy of that textbook. That's where I copied it from. So here is uh, what you would receive as a handout if we were in class. Um, here's a summary of what's going to happen with Asa Thor and it introduces his challenge. Um, what I'd like you to do is read the excerpt, and then uh, here are the, the questions. What stage of the heroic cycle did Thor undergo? This is a small version of the heroic cycle. The next slide, uh, or the slide in the future, has the full 18, 18 levels. Um, which aspects do the characters represent? So the, the gods that are mentioned, or the characters in this story, what are they really? And finally, how did Norsemen understand heroism? Heroism for us might be different than how it was in antiquity. You know, just think real quick, jot down if you can, uh, what makes a hero to you? Why, why is something heroic? Why is someone heroic? What do they do that makes them a hero? Uh, and then you can compare that definition with Thor and the things that Thor does that make him a hero. So here's page one. Uh, it has that same summary, the challenge, and uh, the questions that you can answer. You don't need to read this part. If you're reading the prose edda, um, this is where it starts on uh, number 47, where Thor and his companions are heading off to undergo this challenge. Page two. page three, and finally page four, with a lovely image of Thor himself. And here is uh, another link for that ebook if you'd like to check this out online. <clears throat> oh, I said 18 stages. I meant 17. A little slip of the tongue here. Um, but here is uh, Joseph Campbell's monomyth cycle. Um, for the monomyth that I'd have my scholars write, they had to pick only five of these. And now you all can see that at least five of these stages show up in every good story. All right, Dave War, that means we're at the end. Uh, again, if you could read that, read that brief excerpt reading. Uh, and answer the questions. Leave your answers in the comments and we will try to have a little 
quarantine online discussion roll in. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed a very brief look at Norse mythology.